Soli Deo Gloria, for God's glory alone. Thankful for my brother, Stephen Obert, who brought a great sermon last weekend in my absence. Thankful for what God's doing in and through the people of our church, for his glory alone. In the first two weeks, we worked hard to look at who God is is and why he's deserving of all the glory. So far we have acknowledged that this thing called life that we find ourselves in is set in the framework of something much bigger than we've likely understood it to be. The story we find ourselves in is really an epic already in progress. It's God's epic and we are God's creation set in motion for God's glory. The evidence of the handiwork of the almighty creator is all around us, and yet mankind has been consumed with the lie that Satan sold Adam and Eve, and every one of us since then, that we can make the story about ourselves. And so in our sin, we take every opportunity to try to hijack God's fame and glory and replace it with our own, with our agenda, with our dreams and hopes. We've mastered the making of our own lame after-school special. We've bought into the secular narrative that life is about our happiness and our name. In doing so, we we waste precious days of our life earning a pathetic clap-clap finish at the end of our me-centered production. Instead of joining the heavenly host that will cheer the almighty God with an everlasting standing ovation and celebratory feast, We have to understand that our infatuation with our own little story and our determination to make our story as big as we possibly can blinds us to the massive God story that surrounds us on every side. Today, I want to turn a corner in this little mini-series, four-part mini-series, as we prepare for Holy Week, I'm excited for Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday to come. And in turning the corner in this little four-part series, I, I want us to see the utter privilege it is for us to be part of the supporting cast that makes much of the great name of the Lord God. What is so awesome as we look to God's revealed word is that we don't have to try out to earn a role in God's epic. We don't have to be the best of the best or perform at a certain level to play a part in a life that would be for God's glory and sharing the life-changing gospel with others. It's actually the opposite. See, the kind of people that God uses are not self-made stars, but they are a very unlikely cast. Thereby the title of this morning's sermon, an unlikely cast. See, it's a people of his choosing that are given the important task of making much of his great name, not because of their resume, but because of the resume of another. What the Lord simply requires of those he will use for the making much of his name is trust in him. In what he will do in and through us. That they learn to surrender and let God actually use their insufficiencies and weaknesses to make much of his great name in a way that wouldn't happen if they were the most accomplished or the best of the best. See, we have to be willing to allow God to flip our thinking upside down 
and see that it's not our stellar performance he uses, but it is our surrender and our trust in him that he uses most. See, God is already the brightest, the elite, the richest, the most powerful, the best. He doesn't need us for any of that. To understand this better this morning, we turn to Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> the setting of our passage is a, about 1300 BC, and in God's providence, God's people are enslaved, toiling day and night, building cities and monuments for the false worship and the temporary fame of the pharaohs of Egypt. But God is at work in all of this and has a plan of deliverance for his people and a plan to put his power on display for the watching world for generations to come. But to execute this plan, he, he wants a spokesperson, a leader, a representative to take his agenda to the most powerful empire in the world in that day and demand that they let his people go. Now, one would think that for such an important, globally witnessed event, that spokesperson that God would choose would be someone proven, someone studied, someone well-spoken, someone who's a natural leader, someone who was influential. Nobody would have guessed that God would have chosen a stuttering shepherd with a weak self-esteem who's rapidly aging and on his way in the final downslope of his life. On top of that, a man who had a criminal record for killing one of Pharaoh's slave drivers in Egypt. If God showed up here today and asked for a spokesperson from our church family, we likely wouldn't push a guy like Moses to the front of the line. And what that reveals about you and I is that we have a deeper understanding about the kind of people God is looking for to go out and tell about him to the watching world. To speak of his amazing grace. This is why God's word is so helpful for us to be challenged in our thinking and our priorities. So let's look to Exodus chapter 3. We're going to study all the way through verse 15, but I want to start by just reading verse 1 through 9. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a, a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. What a special insight this is. In this most remote and intimate interaction between God and Moses. 
In this, God makes himself manifest. The angel of the Lord and the burning of this bush that's on fire, although it's not being consumed, as the scripture testifies. And it is here that God interacts with this aging shepherd named Moses. The glory of God is marvelous. And it is most mysterious and wondrous. Can you imagine the, the, the overwhelming sight and experience that this was for Moses? God is clear to reveal himself as the one true God. He shares his view of his people suffering and announces that he has a plan to deliver his people out of bondage to a, a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is amazing news. I think the use of the word broad here is, is profound given the fact that the people are currently trapped. They're enslaved. They're bound. And yet God is about to give them freedom, space, room to run, a good and broad land Church, is this not what God does when he frees us from the shackles of our enslavement to sin? Giving us room to run and, and to live for his eternal glory and no longer our lame attempt to have glory ourselves. Praise God for this. It is God who saves. It is God who makes a way for his people to be delivered. He is worthy of our praise and our trust. There is nothing we do to be saved or to earn his deliverance. It is only by his amazing grace and only by his perfect timing that he sets the spiritually captive free and gives them new life. But the story of God's epic that exists for God's fame and, and glory doesn't end there with the freedom of his people. It, it doesn't end with him saving his people and taking them into the promised land and calling it good. Someday God will call an end to suffering and pain and death and bring us into the new heavens and the new earth. But that day has not yet come. In the meantime, God has a plan. A plan to be known and praised by a worldwide people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And he intends for his chosen people to be his spokesman of the gospel and of his glory to the nations. This is the call on your life if you're saved in Jesus Christ. This is where you and I come in. But before we get to that, let's see how God intends to use Moses to fulfill his plan as it helps us digest our own journey Look with me at verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. What? Wait, wait. I love what you were saying to me a minute ago. You set our people free out of slavery. That's great. Oh, that's good news. Wait, wait, but did you just say you're going to send me to go do that? See, Moses was surely stoked that God was planning to free Israel from slavery, but to hear God's plan to use him as the spokesperson was shocking for Moses to hear. Me? You're going to send me to represent you? To interact with Pharaoh? the most powerful man in the world, you want me to be the one to lead your people out of slavery? And I think many of us relate to this in God's choosing us to be in his family, to be adopted into his family, and then to be sent as his witnesses into the world to testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his great name. And, and you're shocked at that because you know you. 
And what you need to remember is God knows you better than you know you. He knows everything about you through and through. Your worst, the worst of your worst. The stuff that you won't even acknowledge is true about you. He knows about you. He knows everything you're capable of and everything you're not capable of. He knows how you work and how you don't work. And you're thinking, he still chooses me. I want you to stop and really take that in for a moment. If you are saved by God and you have trusted your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you are not a bystander anymore. You are not on the outside looking in. You are a part of the eternal family of God and you have been chosen by God to do His mighty work and fulfill His perfect will. And God doesn't make a mistake in this. He knows you better than anyone. Even better than you know yourself and He chooses you. And you say, well, what about all of my wicked stuff? Well, he makes that right through the perfect holy blood of God the Son. He doesn't just ignore it. He doesn't make light with it. No, it must be dealt with in the fullest way. And it is perfectly and wholly dealt with at the cross of Jesus Christ. But still, even with all that in view, many of us still say what Moses says next. Look at verse 11. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? You've got to stop for a second because I think sometimes we can kind of trivialize this interaction, this going to Pharaoh, because we've kind of read about it from a distance. It all just feels a little too familiar. Pharaoh is the dominant power in the world in this time. This is a guy that's been exiled to the to the hillside to tend to sheep. He's not a high-ranking person. He. I want you to see how big this is. So he's like, who am I? Now, there is a good side to what Moses says here and a bad side. I want us to see. The good side is that Moses rightly sees that he is unworthy of, to be chosen by the holy and almighty God to do this work. You and I should have this view as well in light of our sin, of, of his choosing us. Because, because of our sin, we are worthy only for God's righteous and eternal wrath. That is a good truth to know and to never forget. That that is what's due your sin. Why is that important that we never forget it? So that grace never loses its potency in your life. That grace is never anything lesser than amazing for you. You, you wake up on a Sunday morning and you're, you're tempted just to kind of like, Make your morning about your own comfort and kind of just being lazy. And you wake up on Monday morning, you just kind of want to, oh, I'll get to reading the word later. And I got to get to my other stuff. And just, just don't let grace lose its potency. Because when it's potent in your life, it will cause you to worship him and live for him. We need to never forget this so that we stay humble, so that we don't well up with ego. 
or pride. Now, the flip side of what Moses, of Moses' response, the bad side, in hearing that God has chosen him, now watch this, he's too focused on himself and not enough focused on God. We're guilty of this as well. See, Moses is saying, who am I? In other words, what are my credentials to do this? And don't we do that too? You might say, hey, I'm not studied enough. I'm not well-spoken enough. I'm not comfortable in front of others or interacting with strangers. But I want you to see something in Moses that we often miss. He wasn't the super talented, accomplished guy. He's a stuttering shepherd. See, when you and I think of Moses, we think of Mighty Moses. But Moses was, was not extra talented or gifted. In the next chapter, in Exodus 4.10, we read, Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of the tongue. You're asking me to be a spokesperson for you, and I'm terrible at that. I'm a stuttering man. And in this, Moses is stuck thinking, surely I'm not the guy. I'm not equipped for this task. But church, we need to let Scripture show us that this is not unusual for God to choose someone who is weak or struggling or ill-equipped. It's actually a normal way that God works in casting those that would, he would choose to play a part in his epic, to tell of his gospel and sing of his glory. I mean, just consider how uncredentialed the following people are that God chooses to be a part of the supporting cast of his grand epic for his glory. This is just a taste in the, in the Old Testament cast, Gideon was afraid. Ehud was left-handed. That, there's a crazy story to read. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah was too young. David was just a shepherd boy and no credentials to be Israel's next king. He had an affair and then murdered the guy who was her husband in order to get rid of that whole thing. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job lost his kids and his career. I mean, that's just a sampling. What about some of the New Testament cast of God's epic? John the Baptist was a weird guy. With a weird diet. Peter denied Christ, constantly messed up. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. The disciples were untrained blue collar workers. They were God's choice to launch the New Testament church, the New Covenant church as we know it today. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul persecuted Christians. Timothy was too young. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> Here's the point. Sorry, I had have fun with that one. God likes to use those who have screwed up. Those who have real weaknesses. Those who have been stuck in what seems to be a very mundane life. God does this because when he does great things through them, all the glory belongs to him. Which is where it belongs. Soli Deo Gloria. To God be the glory alone. That's the point. 
This is why God chooses an unlikely cast. So that when God does mighty things in and through us, the world says, all glory be to God, not to us. Church, hear me clearly this morning. It's not about you. It's, about, it's not about how good you are, how skilled you are, how ready you feel. God will use you on the stage of His creation for the making of His great and eternal name, not because of who you are and what you bring to the table, but because of what He brings to the table and because of who He is. And so I just ask you, how are you stuck? What excuse do you continue to make because you're making it all about you? Where you really are on the sideline and not in the game. You're not risking. You're not following through on what God is doing. He gives you today to serve him, to make much of his name. What are you doing with that? It's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do through you. So practically, what does this mean for you and I? It means you have to stop trying to make it about you. It means you need to lay down your pride and your ego. You you need to experience the forgiveness of God and be healed in your hurts. And be good with it, truly being all about Jesus. Jesus. Truly yielding to God. To say, I belong to you. I want it to be about you. You call me to do this or that, then that's what I will joyfully do. And what about when you're just not feeling it? It's not feeling it. When you just don't think you can do it. Notice here, I want you to notice, God doesn't give Moses a pep talk as a response. He doesn't slow down and say, you can do it. God doesn't say to us in response to our feeling defeated or ill-equipped, you just have to believe in yourself. No, that's the world's self-motivation in their denial to the Almighty God. God's response to Moses is a simple declaration of truth. Five life-shifting words. Look at verse 12. He said, I will be with you. And this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. This is going to happen, Moses. It's going to happen not because of your credentials, because of what you're capable of. It's going to happen because of me. It's going to happen because I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be working in and through you. I will be with you. See, Moses didn't need to think any higher of himself. He needed to think higher of the one who is with him. The one who created him and made him the way he is. The one who chose him and was sending him. The one who is in charge of all things and over all things. The one who was ordaining and sustaining his very existence in that moment. God is saying, You can do this because I will be with you. And God has used these life-shattering, life-shifting words to everyday, average, unlikely people time and time again. It's those same words Jesus told his previously cowardly, failed, scared disciples. After experiencing the risen Christ and hearing his promise in the Great Commission that he would be with them all the way to the end, they rose up and gave all they had to making much of his name. I mean, every one of them died for it, except one. For the advancement of the gospel and the name and glory of God. 
This is the commission to you and I as well. And Jesus said to them, I have been given. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Church, i got to ask you, you got to make it personal for you today. What have you done with those words? Christian, what have you done with those words? Is it just, thanks God, having you around makes things easier, a little more convenient? Or, okay, God, I'll remember that when I can't do it on my own. Or, thanks God, I'll turn that news into a vehicle to fulfill my agenda. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No. None of that. We need to say, God, I recognize it is all from you and all for you. I am nothing without you. I am so utterly privileged to be chosen by you And I will obey you. And I will do what you've called me to do. No matter what it cost me. Because you are God. And you are with me. And at work in and through me. Now Moses asked a great question next. Verse 13. Moses said to God. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? We have to understand about the culture at this time and the religious system that surrounds the people of Israel is that there was many gods that people believed in. Many little g gods. Not capital G god, but little g pretender gods. Man-made gods. God of the soil, God of fertility, God of the sun, God of death. So in the midst of all that, Moses is saying, how do I describe you to those who believe in all these little gods, in this culture that's surrounded by all these man-made gods? Now listen carefully to God's answer in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, if you're thinking, hey, that just clears it up. <laughs> you got to really pay attention to what's being said here. I am who I am is taken from a Hebrew word that means to exist. What God is telling Moses is, I exist. I am real. In this, he's totally slamming the sinful man-made religious system and putting to shame all of the little g man-made gods that are not real, that people devote their whole lives to. He makes no excuses. He gives no explanation. He makes no justification. He just straightforward says, I am. Whether you come to know me or not, Whether you acknowledge me or not, I am. Look at verse 15. God said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. God refers to himself as the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's representative of four Hebrew consonants, Y-H-W-H. This was such a sacred thing that the Jewish people wouldn't even pronounce it out loud. We add vowels to it and say Yahweh, the name of God. And it's a name not to be taken lightly. It's full of power and wonder. It's the name describing his eternal reality, 
power and unchangeable character. In a world where values and morals and laws are constantly changing and shifting, we can find true stability and security in our unchanging God. So when he says, I am, he is saying, I am eternal. I am the one. I am beyond and above all creation. I am who I am. No matter what you think or what you've been told, I am. God says in Isaiah 54, 5, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. When he says, I am, do you get it? Does your life understand the power and the majesty that his name demands? Do you get that he always has been, is right now? And always will be. That everything that exists, exists for his glory alone. And I just pray right now. Look at me real quick. In the moment of that, I just pray you see all the little ways We're guilty of making it about us, about me. Slow to really consider who he is and therefore why he is worthy of all of the glory alone. Your utter obedience and surrender, not to fulfill your agenda, but his why it is an utter privilege to die to self and live for him. God is saying, I am the center of everything. I'm running the show. I am the same every day. I am the owner of everything. I am the Lord. I am the most powerful. Don't overthink that you're going to the strongest guy in the world, Pharaoh. I am. I am is sending you. He is my creation. He exists this very moment because I will it. You need fear no man. You need overthink of yourself not at all. I am. I am the most powerful. I am the creator and sustainer of life. I am more than enough for you. I am God. No better. I am. For those of you sitting here today who don't know God, You're hearing about this bigness of God that life is about his epic story and not yours. I pray that God is revealing himself to you this morning. Loving you enough to wreck you. To convict you of your selfish sin. To see your utter desperate need for a savior. Some of you sit here today very stuck. Very stuck in a lifestyle and a practice that most of the time is all about you. Your ability, your ambitions, your stature, your satisfaction. And if you're honest, maybe you feel like God and church, Christian life might just slow you down. Get in the way. And if this is you, 
I just pray you just humbly consider this. If God's name is I am, if everything that is is because of him and for him, then that means your name is I am not. And and every moment you try to make it about you is a moment you're trying to move something that's immovable. Your name will never be I am. I am not the center of the universe. I am not in control. I am not the solution. I am not the star of the story. I am not all-powerful. I am not calling the shots. I am not God. But He is. We have ignored for far too long the most important truth known to man, that is, that this life is not for us. It's for and about Him. The sooner you get that, the sooner you get the two stories, yours and His, in line, the sooner you realize that there is most definitely an epic already in progress And that for too many years, you've been trying to make sweet after-school specials, chasing the clap-clap finish. The sooner you really start living life with Yahweh, for Him, instead of thinking we have Him and Christianity and church all figured out so we can just kind of take our lazy buy-in to our souvenir faith and keep going, the sooner we start realizing that God uses unlikely people to do big and amazing eternal things in His everlasting story, the better we will do to stop trying to make a name for ourselves and and be willing to trust Him and grow in Him and let Him do His mighty work in and through us. The glory of all creation is God. The God of all creation chooses to use people who are small, average, ordinary, slow to do big things for His glory. And God is saying to you and me all the time the very same thing He's saying to Moses. Don't doubt. Don't deviate. Don't fear any man. Don't make it about you. Trust me. Let me use your weaknesses to put my glory on display. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Paul, the Apostle Paul, quotes Jesus and says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what Jesus says. So Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness. I am content with insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So I just ask you, have you been content with weakness and calamities? Where you've had to swallow your pride and and do the selfless thing and think of someone else before yourself? Before you protect your name and your reputation, you you died to self and sought to, to humble yourself and sought peace and Forgiveness and patience. Here, Paul, he's, I am content with weakness. I'm content with insults. I'm content with hardships. I'm content with persecutions. I'm content with calamity. That's not a small word. Lord, if it's your will that my life equals calamity, the people I love the most equal calamity. I belong to you. It is for you. It's not for me. You don't owe me my kingdom. You don't owe me my kids, my job, my money, my health. That's all for you. Paul got it. Do you? God picked Moses not because of any of the things that you and I would have been trained to look for. 
The only thing that God needed to know about Moses was that he would listen, he would follow, he would trust God. You and I must stop and do business with this right here today. What do you need to confess before the Lord and repent of? Are you feeling lately that you're not fit to be useful to God, that you have too much baggage, too much work to do, other things that are keeping you busy? Brother, sister, you will never get yourself right. If you're waiting to get in the game because you have a little work to do to get yourself right, you'll never get there. You are dependent on God for all of it. All of the growth, all of the power, all of the wisdom. Don't leave the gospel behind and treat it like the doorway to the Christian life. Let it be the moment by moment power for your Christian faith. Rightly seeing your insufficiency and the same time your utter dependence on God for his grace and power. Truly and fully trusting him in all things recognizing he is with you and at work in and through you. Hear this. You are breathing today, right now, because God is not done with you for his purposes. Every day he ordains that you live is a day you have an opportunity to live for him. He looks for the same thing in us as Moses. Will you listen to him? Will you submit yourself to his word? Long to know him all the more? Will you, will you follow his leading? Will you trust in his timing and provisions? What needs to change? So that all the Holy Spirit-driven conviction that's happening in you goes to work. What what, what needs to go away so you can have some time and space to go here? What needs to change about some of the me-centered rhythms of your family and schedule so you can involve more of your kingdom family in your life to walk with you, know you, hold you accountable? press you to Christ God's agenda is happening with or without you will you join the unlikely cast that has come before you church's name is Yahweh And he will be, as it says in verse 15, remembered throughout all generations. Next week, we're going to look at how we can begin to really embrace and enjoy the supporting role in God's epic for his glory. We're going to look at one guy in Scripture who really got it and understood the privilege it was to live his whole life for the glory and name of the Lord. I pray you will join us. But now, in response, right response of praise, let's thank God that he is with us and at work in and through us, even in the storms, for his great glory and name. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day that you have made this wonderful opportunity to, to sit and study your holy word, to to be convicted of sin, to mature in our understanding according to your revelation, to put away our misunderstandings according to any form of religion or just personal thought. I thank you, Lord, that you are with us. I thank you, Lord, that you've chosen us and have called us to do your work and to make much of your name. I pray we would not make light with that. I pray that there be an emboldening today. That we would see before us this week a mission field. 
a purpose to the rest of our day, and if you will it, tomorrow and this week, to speak of the glory of God, to testify, to die to self, to put others before ourselves, to mature in these things for your glory and for your name. I continue to pray as I have been for those who are here who maybe have truly never repented of their sin to trust in you and be saved, to, to be born again, that they would speak with those that brought them today and they would, they, they would lay down their lives. They would trust their lives to you to know the living God. They wouldn't make light with these eternal things. Oh God, you are worthy. And so we... We join with the psalmist in this final psalm in in, in Psalm 46 and just worship you and yield to you and exalt your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.